Welcome to the Beyond Cinema and Bio.com studio at TIFF, Peter Hosan Chan. Thank you. Um, firstly, congratulations on another film reaching kind of the upper echelon of the film festival circuits. Um, your films have had kind of a parallel path, oftentimes very well received by the festivals, but a few of them also having pretty crazy, amazing commercial successes, especially in China. Actually, it's uh, the other way around. Other, other way My around. films yeah. always have pretty big commercial potential in its domestic market. Yeah. And once in a while, it, you know, it fits in with the festival and market. It sneaks out to the yeah. festival market. Exactly. Um, for you in making films, which is, uh, you know, which is kind of the primary, which feels like the primary audience? Do you feel part of that international community of filmmakers, or do you feel like you're it is, uh, regional. it is hard to define what the international market is because it changes all the time, and and also the um, the the uh, I'm I'm not exactly I, I I'm you know I admit that I'm not exactly a typical festival kind of director. I I make films that appeals to your know, emotions, uh, and sometimes it's defined as a bit too sentimental. Uh, but that's how I like to watch films as, as an audience, and I think first and foremost, you make films that you want to see. And um, and uh, however, most of my films uh, touch on issues that are deeper than normal uh, commercial, big, broad commercial movies. But having grown up in Hong Kong and in the Hong Kong film industry in its heydays and eighties and the nineties, uh, we're so used to making big commercial movies. Most of them were genre films in a way. And we try to sneak in a little bit of a personal ambition or message in the middle of a package that is completely commercial. So to me, a lot of times people would ask me, who do you appeal to? I said, first and foremost, I make films that I liked. And whether I choose movie stars to play in my films, like in most cases, it's not even a compromise anymore. It's just in my it's in my blood. I mean, it's because that's the only way I know how to do it. Yeah. For example, this film, it's it's uh, very much about social problems, and it's probably one of my most uh, 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 ambitious movie in terms of, of dealing with contemporary social issues. And it's actually based on facts, based on a, a news program of something that actually happened on child abduction. It's not a normal Peter Chan's kind of film. But however, uh, I was completely uh, taken with the story when I watched the documentary. And then I just couldn't stop thinking about making it to a movie. And when I started casting it, uh, people were thinking maybe, especially, especially with the rural farmer's wife, which is the captor's, you know, the abductor's wife, uh, it should be played by a no-name actor, then it gives it a certain authenticity. I ended up choosing like the biggest wow, sweetheart, Zhao Wei, who's Zhao the Wei. biggest movie star in Hong Kong, which is like Julia Roberts' is, you know. Right. Uh, uh, and, um, and then I managed to got a great performance out of her. Uh, she completely wear no, no makeup. And, and it's a choice between whether I work with a movie star or a no-name actress. And was that a compromise? No. I, I, I don't think I would know how to make that movie with, with, you know, with a you know, with the no-name actors, actress. Was she excited by that as well, that element of it? That it she was, was very excited by that. Yeah. But then, you know, her first instinct was to turn it down because she didn't think she could deliver that performance. She never lived in a rural, you know, uh, village. She's always been, she's she grown up, she grew up in a, not a first-tier city, in a second-tier city, but still a city. And uh, she's always been in makeups and very fashionable and everything else. She didn't feel like she had a connection to that kind of grassroots, uh, earthy, rural character. But she was great. She that was must great. be exciting for a director too. I know oftentimes taking someone out of their element and putting them into something, when they're, when they're willing to take that risk with yeah. you, it's great. it empowers you, it empowers them, they feel like they're taking a journey they haven't taken before, and as a result you feel like you're creating something for the first time or discovering something for the and first time. And for the audience it almost feels like, um, because I've done it so many times, because of the fact that I always opted for big movie stars in the world and then because the subject matter of most of my films are a bit challenging even though they're still commercial movies, but it's a bit challenging so it takes, the movie stars needs to readapt themselves into the role. And, and what 
my method is to have as much discussion as possible, you know, over drinks and everything, days on ends, and try to take out some of the inner self in the movie star that we don't know about, that the audience don't know about, and try to magnify that and write that into the screenplay. So they're like playing themselves, you know, to a certain extent. For you as a director, how do you, when you when you decide on using someone or you want to just introduce them to the script and the idea, where do you go with them? Like, do you just talk to them on the phone? Do you have them come into an office? Do you go and sit with them in a cafe we to, somewhere? We have to sit down. You know, we have to sit down. And in a restaurant, to... though? Yeah, uh, or a cafe? Sometimes in a cafe. Yeah. Uh, and it takes a lot of, uh, you know, convincing. Uh, you got to get them secure. They got to feel very secure. And then you got to take them on a journey together. And then they're going to pull their guts and their hearts out and then be really open with you. Uh, it's like making friends. It's like very deep friendship conversations, and uh, and then when you get them to that point, you can do wonders. And by the time you get on set, it's multiple choice with the director. You're just choosing. It's it's really up to them because I don't believe you could start telling them how to act out the scene because we're not actors. You know, we can't tell them how to act out the scene. All you can do is to have a lot of intimate conversations with them, gain their trust and then have them open them up so that they're completely into the character and then they'll do the rest. Um, you talk about the kind of dichotomy between rural and urban. Obviously you grew up in one of the most I, high, you know, exactly. high level I know jobs. nothing about rural life. So, so for you, is that something that the locations serve to inspire? How important is that? Like where did you go to find do you go to the source of where the story came from and go to those places, or do you just kind of take yourself out of your surroundings? The benefit of this script? film is it's got a very strong premise, and it's all based on fact, and it's stranger than fiction. I mean, what happened in real life was completely incredible. And uh, I took that and worked with a writer to turn that into a script. And the rural part was actually very limited. I mean, there was only one scene in the village, uh, a long scene like a seven, eight minute scene, but that's only one scene. However, it's still about rural people in the big cities. So yeah. we shot in the, in the underbelly of the city, you know, in the poverty-stricken area of the city, uh, which is not the kind of life that I, I know, uh, the kind of people that I know. It's very, very kind of grassroots China today. But it was interesting, and then as we were shooting the movie, we, I really didn't have to, to live there. Uh, for a month to get the taste of what life was like, you know, you walked into those narrow streets. It's called um, village within a city. You know, in, in a lot of uh, southern China, uh, Chinese big cities, because of the rapid developments, uh, they tear down areas and then build buildings around it, build like completely metropolitan, you know, center of town, you know, like downtown all the new glass buildings around it. But there are areas where they can't evict the people. And then these are the areas, the pockets of areas in the middle of these huge big cities that you actually see life like the village, like it was 20, 30 years ago. Uh, it's called village within a city. Does it, do you like that feeling of being kind of out of your element? Does that also? Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. I mean, because the experience of making a movie is like you, step into other people's lives, you know, every year and a half or two, then you step into other people's lives. I guess it's even more challenging for actors. You actually wear their costumes and speak their dialogue. But for directors, it's almost like observing. It's almost like going to college and taking a class, you know, is it, a movie. Is it cool then being able to take that very kind of specific setting and show it to people in Venice, Italy, and having... I know, and, and having, having discussions like this, and then and to tell America. them about things as if I'm the expert, but I just really have a crash course in two months, you know. But Venice has been a big supporter yeah. over the years. Yeah, yeah. I remember you had a closing Definitely. night film there. Yeah. Um, and, uh, of course, Cannes played a competition yeah. there like three years ago. Yeah. Um, the in terms of the festival circuit and being able to talk about films with Europeans, North Americans, etc., is that um, like what does it serve for you artistically? It's uh, it's good to see different people's perspective, and and I think that um, without being too um, 
social conscious again. I hate movies to be preachy. Uh, but then it's good whenever you have interviews, then you actually get to talk about your film. And in the process of talking about your film, you discover sometimes why you're making the movie. You know, and uh, and also it's good to to actually have people understand each other's culture, more understanding, so there are less of uh, racial profiling. A lot of times, it's 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 there are so many misunderstanding about each other's world, and especially with the rapid growth of China, there is a lot of misunderstanding what China is. And, and, and I think through making films that it's, it's good that nowadays we are, I mean in the past, in the last decade we were all busy making big period action films that has no relevance to contemporary Chinese society. But in the last few years there's a change of, uh, uh, of the trend in China that the audience in China wants to see films about themselves uh, in contemporary realistic life. Uh, whether it be a comedy, drama, love stories, or whatever. Uh, and then in that sense, when you take them to the film festival, we, we talk about China a lot more, what, how it's like, and some of the things are absurd, but there's a reason behind each absurdity. And this is part of what this film is about. You talk about seeing films that you would like to see, that you would like to experience. What was that for you growing up? Like, what were the kinds of films that you were watching and enjoying? Were they... China, from Chinese filmmakers, or were they from British filmmakers? I, I grew up watching mostly American films. I think uh, at my age, I'm very, very privileged to be able to grow up with uh, movies in the 70s. I mean, back when American films were great, a lot of great movies. You know, it's not just superhero movies. Yeah. And uh, and I kept telling people, you know, I'm not exactly a big fan of European cinema. I mean, films that are way too art house for me sometimes, I find it hard to understand. There's, you know, films that you can have so many different interpretations. I like films to be, I like films to be, to deal with uh, tough subject matter, but I like them to be, I like the director to have a perspective and not open it up for me to decide what it is. Uh, so I've watched a lot of American films in the 70s. And, uh, and that's really the balance of art house and commercial. Somewhere right in the middle is always what I love. If there was someone from that 70s era of golden filmmaking in the US that you could work with today, whether they're alive or dead now, who would it be? I wouldn't say work with, but uh, the biggest influence have always been uh, Woody Allen. Uh, I know it's a cliche to some extent, but, but it's always been. I mean, most of my earlier films, mostly relationship films, it's always been the way he looks at relationships, the duality of, of, of things, and then the gray areas, you know, instead of black and white, you know, and uh, I've always loved this film, and even now, I mean, he's still making movies. Yeah. Um, amazingly, one a year. Yeah, uh, amazingly. I mean, yeah. There's almost nobody else who could keep up that, that, that um, you know, momentum, you know, year after year after year. It was very cool getting to meet you, um, and uh, I know someone who had to kind of choose between whether they wanted to win an award in Taiwan and China. The fact that you've won both Golden Rooster and Golden Horse um, is obviously a pretty significant achievement yeah. in and of itself, um, and shows kind of the kind of the, just the reception that you've had and the mark that you've made um, in your own society as well as out here. So it's really nice getting to meet you and have a chat with you. So thanks Thank for coming you. in.